wireless, wireless transmission. So we spoke about wired transmission yesterday. Now we're on to the wireless. First, no quiz today, quiz results later. First, if, if, if we have time at the end of the lecture, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss the quiz, the quiz question answers. But we, let's try and keep up with the other section, the IT section. So I think we'll get through this, get to the same level. We want to cover the basics of wireless transmission and then we'll go through some examples of different wireless media. Our, so some common examples of wireless transmission systems, or wireless communication systems, we use it for television transmission, what's called terrestrial microwave. Microwave refers to the frequencies we're using, or the wavelengths, micro wavelengths. Terrestrial refers to on the ground as opposed to satellite microwave. Terrestrial means that our base, our transmitting wireless antennas are on the ground. So, <laughs> it, 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 yes, microwave refers to the range of frequencies used and it's using the similar range of frequencies. Yeah, wave, micro, means micromillimeter. Um, uh, um, micrometer, yeah, micrometer. Your kitchen, your your, and your microwave, if you use near your wireless LAN laptop, can interfere because they're using the same frequency. So yes, your microwave can interfere with other wireless transmission systems. You should not use your laptop inside the microwave. It will not work. Satellite microwave, another example using similar frequencies. We'll go through these technologies after we go through wireless transmission. Just some quick examples. Wireless LAN, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, mobile phones, infrared remote control, examples of wireless communication systems using different frequencies. The basic model that we can think about is that we have a transmitter, same as our normal communications, a transmitter and a receiver. The transmitter takes our signal that we want to transmit and uses an antenna to convert that into some electromagnetic waveform that we transmit across the air wirelessly. The signal is received by a receive antenna and convert back to some electrical current and then we've received the signal. How do the antennas work? What does an antenna do? An antenna converts our electrical current into some electromagnetic waves. So we feed some current into the antenna and it creates some waveforms to send from the transmit antenna to the receive antenna. Those waves, we're dealing with a certain range of frequencies starting from several kilohertz up to hundreds of gigahertz, so the range of frequencies we're using. An antenna at the transmitter and the receiver have the basic have the same characteristics. So in the subsequent discussion, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the receive or transmit antenna, they have the same characteristics. The direction and the propagation of the wave that comes out of the antenna depends upon the antenna shape and its design. And that's quite important. So we'll talk about different types of antennas and explain their relationship. An isotropic antenna, we can think as a, a theoretical antenna, which it transmits a signal and that waveform that it transmits propagates in all directions with equal intensity. So if we have an isotropic antenna, it transmits, the energy propagates in that direction behind, to the sides, up and down, in equal strength. So if we measured the signal strength... No, this is an isotropic, is, let's say, is a theoretical antenna, a perfect antenna that propagates in all directions. Yeah, so... We'll talk about different types of antennas and how they propagate signals in different directions, a directional antenna. 
if you try to visualise this isotropic antenna, we transmit with some power. We transmit our signal with some signal strength. We know that power gets weaker over distance. It attenuates. So, from our isotropic antenna, the signal, let's say one metre in that direction, the received power will be some level. One metre above, the received power will be the same as one metre in that direction. That is, the received power one metre away from the isotropic antenna in all directions, up, down, left, right, front, back, will be the same strength. So if we drew a plot or some diagram that showed what is the received power one metre away, it would be the same. We'd have a sphere around that isotop isotropic antenna. So we think this is a theoretical antenna. We cannot build one that's perfect like that, but we can get close. But we usually classify other antennas, real antennas, relative to an isotropic antenna. Isotropic, the energy is dispersed in all directions equally. A non-isotropic or is the energy is concentrated in one particular direction. So a specific type and one that you commonly use is an omnidirectional antenna. The power is propagated equally in, one, in all directions on one plane. That is, on the horizontal plane, front, back, and on the sides, the power is propagated equally in all directions, but up and down, much weaker. So that is vertical plane, the signal strength is much weaker one metre away than on the horizontal plane. That's an example of an omnidirectional antenna. These, I would expect, are omnidirectional antennas. The wireless LAN access points that you see the antennas poking up are uh, omnidirectional antennas usually. In the donut. in the donut, that is, one metre away in this direction is the same as one metre in that direction, this one and this one. But one metre up, the signal strength will be much weaker than one metre to the right. So if we drew a plot, then the signal strength is weak up and down but strong around. We get this donut type shape. It's an omnidirectional antenna. That they are common. Useful if you want to cover a particular flat area like a floor or a room. You don't care so much about covering up to the ceiling or up to the next floor. You want to cover all of this room or all of the larger lecture theatre then an omnidirectional antenna is useful for that. More generally, we have directional antennas. So in an omnidirectional, it's not isotropic because in some directions the power is slightly weaker, up and down. So in fact, what we've done with an omnidirectional antenna is we've concentrated the power on one plane, so we've sent the power on one plane but not up and down, not on a vertical plane. In general, a directional antenna concentrates the power in a particular direction. So other types of antennas you'll see, the common one you'll see is this dish-shaped antenna, a parabolic dish. Well, start with a simple dish-shaped antenna. If you've got cable, uh, satellite TV, you may have a dish that on your home that points to the satellite. On the top of this building, there's a dish that points to our other campus. These are directional antennas. What they do is that they concentrate the energy in a particular direction. So, if our directional antenna is pointing this way, one metre away in this direction, the energy or the signal strength is going to be very, very strong. One metre in that direction is going to be very, very weak because the energy is all sent in that direction. One metre to the one metre to the left and right, it focuses the energy. So, it, the signal propagates in a particular direction. It means, if you have a directional antenna, for the receiver antenna to receive, they need to be pointed at each other. Because if you don't point them at, the at each other, the signal will not be received with so strong enough strength at the receiver. So 
the same characteristics that both uh, uh, transmit and receive are same. We can have the different types of antennas. So we, depending on the shape and the design of the antenna, we transmit the signal through the antenna and we receive the signal through another antenna. And they have the same characteristics. Sometimes you'll see diagrams that try to illustrate them. It's hard to draw on two dimensions, but maybe our omnidirectional antenna, if we just look on one plane, looking down on it, we'd see if this is a distance of one metre, we transmit at some power level, Pt. We transmit with some signal strength. Our signal gets weaker over distance. With our omnidirectional antenna, if we look on down on the horizontal plane, one metre away in this direction, we're going to receive with some signal strength, PR. Let's call it PR1. One metre in this direction, it's going to be the same received signal strength. PR1. And in every direction around this omnidirectional antenna. That's why we get this circle to represent every point on this circle we have the same received strength, PR1. If we looked in the other plane, remember omnidirectional the same around but up and down weaker, how do we draw that? Or another way to visualise it is that up and down the signal strength is weaker to the sides it's much stronger. So the signal strength is weaker up and down with our omnidirectional and to the sides much, much stronger. With a, let's say, a parabolic dish shaped antenna, which is highly directional, it concentrates all its power in a particular direction. Then from our antenna we transmit it some power. If it's concentrating the energy in this direction, then the signal strength how are we going to draw it? The signal strength at this point, PR, let's say PR1, if you can see that, is the same strength as here and here. Have I done that right? Other way around. Wrong. Wrong. The inverse of that. Sorry. If we use this to indicate the strength, the longer the line, the larger the power strength. So, in this direction, the signal is much stronger the longer line. In this direction, the signal is much weaker, uh, the shorter line. In this case, in all directions, the signal is the same. But if you look at the omnidirectional from the other perspective, looking on the side, cut through, up is weak, down is weak, to left and right is stronger. With our omnidirectional, it's very strong in this direction, very weak up and down and behind. And you will often see diagrams of antenna patterns which follow these shapes that visualise the strength of the signal. We trans in all cases, we're transmitting at the same transmit power, PT and PT. With our omnidirectional, we disperse the energy equally around that transmitter. With our directional case here, 
the power received at this point, let's call it PR2, if the distance is the same, that is one metre away from the transmitter, if we take measurements one metre away from this transmitter and one metre away from this transmitter and the measurement for this case is PR1 and the signal strength here is PR2, then our directional antenna PR2 is going to be greater than PR1 because what we do is we send, concentrate the energy in one direction so it's going to be much stronger in that direction than if we disperse the energy in all directions. The transmit power is the same. Let's say we transmit with this one at one watt, uh -huh. transmit power, and transmit with this one at one watt. Yeah. And we take a measurement one metre away from our omnidirectional antenna and we measure it as an example one milliwatt. We transmit with one power level and we re receive and we measure this to be one milliwatt. Then with our directional antenna if we measure one metre away, PR2, it's going to be greater than one milliwatt because the power is being concentrated in that direction. If we measured one metre in the opposite direction, it's going to be less than one milliwatt because we in fact lose the power. Instead of sending power in this direction, we concentrate it all in this direction. So, one way to characterise antennas is based on the shape of the antenna pattern but also based upon the gain. That is, how much power increase do we get using a particular antenna and compare it to some reference antenna. And the reference antenna we commonly use is the isotropic antenna. The isotropic antenna is the case where we disperse the signal equally in all directions. So when we talk about antenna gain, if I buy an antenna, one part of its specification will be the antenna gain. And that is a measure of how much stronger the signal is in a particular direction compared to if we used an isotropic antenna. An isotropic antenna, we disperse the signal equally in all directions. A practical antenna, a directional antenna, we concentrate it in one direction and therefore in that direction the signal strength will be greater than using an isotropic. How much greater? Well, that's our antenna gain. And we'll often measure the antenna gain in decibels. And we'll see the units is dBi. The I refers to isotropic. Decibels relative to an isotropic antenna. So it's a way to measure the characteristics of an antenna. A ante an antenna with a gain of 2 dBi, maybe the normal antenna inside your laptop or a wireless LAN access point, if you want a stronger signal strength, you could get a bigger antenna or a different antenna with a gain of 10 dBi and your signal will go further because the antenna concentrates the power in a particular direction. It's designed to increase the signal strength. So we have this concept of antenna gain. As an example, let's say With an isotropic antenna, we receive, we measure the distance, uh, we measure the power, we measure the power one metre away from our isotropic antenna. And we measure that to be PRI. Let's give it a value.
So we've got our perfect isotropic antenna. We measure the signal strength one meter away and it's value PRI, the power received from our isotropic antenna, and let's say give it a value of one watt. We transmit with some power. In both of these cases, or all cases, we assume we transmit with the same power level. And now we have our real antenna. A directional antenna, and it's concentrated to send the signal, or it concentrates the power in one direction, and we measure one meter away from that directional antenna, what is the received signal strength? And we find it to be PR, what, D, directional antenna. And let's give it a value. And let's say it's two watts. That is, the same distance away from the transmitter, we've got more power at the receiver because we've concentrated in a particular direction. So, what's our gain? Using a directional antenna compared to the isotropic, we've doubled the power. The antenna gain of this directional antenna is a factor of two. Or, write the equation, would be PRD over PRI. With our example values, two watts over one watt. So the gain, the absolute gain of this antenna is two. Remember, gain is unitless, it's a ratio. It's and if we express that in decibels, we use our normal equation, gain in dB. <coughs> and because we're going to assume it's relative to an isotropic antenna here, we'll note it as dBi. 10 log 10. And in our example, it will be log of 2 which is 0.3 times 10 is 3, about. The gain of our antenna is 3 dBi. So when we transmit our signal, we can think that this, compared to an isotropic antenna, this antenna increases the signal strength. One, yeah, one meter. It doesn't have to be one meter, the same distance. So we had the same transmit power. I don't know, we don't know what it was. It doesn't matter. But in both cases, we took our isotropic antenna, transmitted with power PT, received one meter away, a distance of one meter, as an example, received one watt took the same transmit power with our directional antenna, received and measured one metre away from it in the direction that it's designed to transmit, and we measured at two watts, therefore we've got a gain of two, or three dBi, three decibels relative to an isotropic antenna. This is it in theory, because our isotropic antenna doesn't exist. But when people design antennas, they can calculate this gain and use it as a, as a part of the specification of that antenna. So when you go and buy an antenna, you can compare them. What is the gain? Let's have a look at some example antennas. Mm -hmm. 
I use some examples from one, one company, Cisco. Cisco is a company that makes networking equipment. The reason I use them as an example is because their website has a lot of details of, of the specifications of their equipment. That, that's the main reason. And in fact, their website has a lot of technical information about how things work. So we'll first we'll look at some of their antennas which are used for wireless LAN. Wireless LAN uses transmissions at a frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. Some systems can also transmit at 5 gigahertz. So you can buy different antennas for your access point, wireless LAN access point. We'll see some of them. Just scroll down. Doesn't give the price, that's one detail at high. So here are three different antennas, different shapes, different designs. First one's an omnidirectional antenna, a ceiling mount, so it's designed so you can put it on the ceiling. But the coverage pattern is omnidirectional. Transmits at frequency 2.4 gigahertz. And in fact, has two different antennas inside. Two separate, two dBi omnidirectional elements. So the gain of each of those is two dBi. Giving, with two antennas in this case, there's a maximum gain of 2.35 dBi. So this is a specification of that antenna. And it gives an approximate range that you could transmit, about 90 metres. And in fact, if we just scroll down a bit, they can indicate the speed at 6 megabits per second if you want to transmit at that data rate, you can cover about 90 metres. So it, this is what the manufacturer claims. In practice, it may be different. Because different obstructions would reduce the, sig the signal strength. The second antenna, let's go up a bit. Different shape, still an omnidirectional antenna, just a different mounting different design, has a gain of 5.2 dBi. Same frequency, it transmits the same frequency and because we've got a larger gain, we transmit with the same power level, the signal will be stronger. That is, in the second case, the gain is such that compared to the isotropic antenna, the power one metre away is going to be greater than two watts. I don't know, whatever it is that gives us 5.2 dBi. So comparing these two, this one allows us to transmit further because our signal strength is larger, about 120 metres. Third one, different shape. Directional antenna, so this really concentrates the energy. The omnidirectional spreads it around in one plane this directional antenna concentrates it in a particular direction. Because we can concentrate that energy, we can get a larger gain. 10 dBi here. Gives us a larger distance. And there's more listed there. Uh, we'll just go down to the bottom. Oh, these are some common type of antennas you see on access points. Those two small ones that stick up, some have had three. Often you can unscrew them and replace them with any of these antennas listed here. These common ones with 2.2 dBi, a gain of 2.2. Yeah, omnidirectional in that case. Yep. Some different wall mount antennas, 6, 5 dBi, 8.5 dBi. But we'll go down the bottom, there's some larger ones small omnidirectional. These are antennas that transmit at with two different frequency bands, dual band, both the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Somewhere we've got some larger antennas. Here we go. 
So now this last one here, a dish antenna, this parabolic shaped dish, dish antenna. Long range directional co connections, 21 dBi is the gain. Distance, 42 kilometres. So here you have an, a dish shaped antenna, does it say the size of this antenna? Maybe. The diameter of this antenna is 61 centimetres. So 61 centimetres, a dish, and what you would normally do is have two dishes pointing at each other. So you have one on one building, maybe this building, one at the Rungsit campus, point them at each other. You need to point them at each other because the signal is propagated in only one direction. The signal is, it's a directional antenna, the signal strength is only st strong in one direction. In the opposite direction, it's very weak. So if they are not aligned, you will not be able to communicate. They need to be aligned very accurately in some cases. So this, this beam width gives us an indicator of how wide that, uh, that signal is in terms of the strong signal. 12 degrees horizontal, 12 degrees vertical. So what's 12 degrees? Something like this. So from the transmitter, it spreads out 12 degrees in that direction and also in that direction. Your receiver needs to be within that 12 degrees. They need to be aligned straighter. So if you point your antenna this way, the signal will go that way. If your receiver's over there, it will not receive the signal. So the directional antennas concentrate the energy in a particular direction. And that's why we can cover a larger distance. Also, the shape and the design, the size of the antenna impacts upon the gain. Larger antenna, larger gain. So there are many examples of antennas there. <laughs> let's, let's have a look at it, uh, some relationship. That was the website that I just visited, those examples. Okay, that's just something about what a parabolic antenna is. We can calculate the gain of an antenna if we know its size and shape. There's an equation, the gain, G, the absolute gain, four times pi times the uh, effective area of that antenna divided by the wavelength squared. And the wavelength, we know. What's the wavelength? How do you calculate wavelength? Wavelength, C divided by F. The speed of light divided by the frequency. So we're transmitting signals of a particular frequency, our wireless LAN, say 2.4 gigahertz. We know the wavelength of the signal we're transmitting. The effective area. That depends upon the design of that antenna. So there's no easy way to give a formula for the effective area. So it depends upon the size. As an example, the parabolic dish antennas, the effective area is about <coughs> half of the physical area. <coughs> AE, area effective. It's <laughs> so What's the effective area of one of these antennas? <coughs> well, not so easy to calculate. So we need to know about the, how the people who design the antennas can do some calculations on that. A parabolic dish antenna, it's about half of the physical area. What's the physical area? Well, about pi r squared. If we know the radius of that dish, the one we had an example was 61 centimetre diameter, so a radius of about 30 centimetres. We know the area, pi times the radius squared, and the effective area is about half of that. And therefore, we could calculate approximately the gain of that antenna. We'll use that in an example shortly. 
note that how does the gain compare to the frequency? Increase the wave wavelength reduces the gain. So how does it compare to frequency? Increase the frequency, increase the gain. Because the wavelength is C divided by F. If F gets bigger, G will get bigger. So larger frequency, everything else the same, larger gain. Larger area, larger gain. You want a large gain antenna, make a big one, use a big one. That's why if you use satellite, you want satellite TV reception, uh, and in some places the signal's weak, you just get a bigger dish, and you can receive better. Because that dish, because of its size, introduces some gain into the signal. And the gain is both at the transmitter and receiver. Okay, that's about antennas. Our antenna transmits some signal and it propagates to the receiver. How does it propagate? Depending upon the frequency, it propagates in different manners. Three general classifications. It can be ground wave, sky wave or line of sight propagation. These are described... So ground wave is for frequencies less than 2 megahertz. Sky wave 2 to 30 megahertz and above that line of sight. These diagrams illustrate those. Ground wave, these lower frequencies, less than 2 megahertz, with these frequencies the signals basically bend around the curvature of the Earth. Because of, art because of the atmosphere and the refraction of the signal that at that particular frequency it curves around the Earth which means it can travel a long way because it, in theory it will go all the way around the Earth. <laughs> if you had a strong enough signal strength then of course the signal loses strength over distance but it travels around the curvature of the Earth. That's useful for very long distance wireless communications. The, at the other end point, line of sight, these at higher frequencies, the signal goes straight. Line of sight means in order to receive the signal, the transmitter, transmit antenna and receive antenna need to be in some line such that they can see each other, a line of sight. If there's something in between them, such as the Earth, they will not be able to communicate. We cannot go through the Earth in this case. With the lower frequencies, we can go around. So we have shorter distance than in this top case. And the middle case is with particular frequencies the signals can bounce off the ionosphere and bounce back off the Earth. So it bounces, reflects until it's received by the receiver. Yes. Yeah, in short wave radio. So we can travel again a longer distance than requiring line of sight. So just different, different frequencies have different physical characteristics. And you've studied this in high school physics where you send light through prisms and so on and you see the different frequencies refra refract uh, differently. The same concepts are applying here. This is the one we're going to deal with mostly. The others are relevant, but we'll focus mainly on line of sight. In fact, it's even more specific than just those three classifications. This table takes our spectrum and divides it even into smaller bands, gives some names to those bands. This is similar information that we had, I think, on the third slide of this presentation, which we had this diagram of the spectrum, different frequencies. The point here is that it gives some information on whether it's ground wave, GW, sky wave or line of sight. And at different frequencies there are again different characteristics, especially regarding obstructions. Anyone have a TV at home? TV. Yes? yes. 
<laughs> Infrared remote control? Yes. How far does it work? <laughs> does it work through rooms? Through walls? Maybe through a very thin wall, but most cases not. It's very hard to... Yeah, if you cover it with your hand, normally you will not be able to change the TV, even several metres away. Because this is using infrared frequencies down here, the infrared band. At these frequencies, they do not pass through obstacles very well. Or there are certain obstacles that will significantly reduce the strength of the signal and therefore will be too weak to be received. So it will not pass through your hand in that case. They can have different parts of, uh, reflect in different manners. So depending on the frequency, some signals pass through obstacles, some don't. What about my wireless LAN laptop? It's got an antenna in the screen. It's connected. I've got wireless access. There's an access point somewhere out in the corridor, which means the signal's passing through the wall. So at two, and that's at 2.4 gigahertz, which is around here. So different frequencies can pass through different obst obstacles or obstructions. So when someone designs a wireless system, they need to consider what frequency to use depending upon how far they want to transmit and on what environment. Do you want to use it indoors or outdoors? Are there going to be buildings in the way or not? So this gives the typical use of some of those frequency bands. So, we transmit our signal from our transmit antenna, it goes to our receiver, there are some impairments. First, we know that the signal gets weaker over distance, we lose some power. And there are mathematical models to say how much power we lose. The free space path loss model is a very common one. It tells us if we transmit with some power over some fixed distance, how much will be the receive power. That is, how much power do we lose? We'll go through that in detail in the next slides. So signal attenuates over distance. That's one thing. We need to deal with that because our receiver electronics can only understand a signal of a particular strength. If the signal is too weak at the receiver, it will not be able to understand. So when we design our wireless system, we need to make sure that the signal received is greater than some threshold such that the receiver can understand it. Other things that cause problems or impairments in wireless transmission, the atmosphere may absorb some of the signal at particular frequencies and therefore it significantly reduces the strength. Multipath, refraction, signals coming off different obstacles. For example, in multipath, when we transmit a signal that actually has different frequency components and different frequencies uh, reflect off obstacles. So what may happen is we transmit a signal with different frequency components. Some parts of the signal will go in this direction and bounce off this building. Some parts may go direct and bounce off and may be direct. The receiver, the car in this case, or a mobile phone inside the car, will receive the signal from different locations. There will be different delays from when it's transmitted to when it's each component is received and with different signal strengths. And this is, we receive the signal along multiple paths. This creates problems for wireless transmission systems. We need to deal with that somehow. And in fact, it can create opportunities in some wireless systems. You see now the wireless LAN access points will have three antennas. So to get the highest speeds, they can take advantage of the fact that we receive multiple signals and do some processing to get the original data. But in mobile communications, mobile phones and so on, when you're mobile, multi-path effects can make it difficult to correctly receive the signal. We're not going to go into any detail of that we're going to focus on how much signal strength do we lose across the path, free space path loss. And 
there's a theoretical model that tells us how much signal strength we lose. This model assumes that we're operating in free space, in a vacuum, no obstructions, no impact of the atmosphere and so on, the perfect case, there's nothing around us. We transmit with some power PT, some signal strength. We transmit our signal across some distance D and we will receive with some power PR. That signal has some frequency or some wavelength. So our equation relates the transmit power, PT, the receive power, PR, the distance we're transmitting, D, the wavelength of the signal we're transmitting and the gains of the two antennas we're using. If we're using antenna, a, a transmit and a receive antenna, they have a particular gain gain of the transmit antenna, gain of the receive antenna. So, if I, know, if I know my transmitter and receiver, I know the gains of my two antennas, I know my transmit power, if I know the minimum receive power that my receiver can understand, PR, I know the frequency of my signal I'm sending and therefore I know the wavelength, so I know PT, PR, GT, GR and Lambda, then I can calculate what is the maximum distance I can separate my transmitter and receiver such that they can communicate. I can calculate D. And that's how we use this path loss model. To design a wireless system, we can calculate how far we can transmit under certain conditions. We'll do a an example calculation in a moment. First, this assumes there are no obstacles. In real life, there are obstacles. There are obstacles like walls, people are obstacles. You're full of a lot of water and signals don't go through water very well in some cases, so you obstruct the signal. The antennas are not perfect in real life, so this assumes they are perfect. But it gives us some upper limit some simple way to calculate the relationship. There are other more realistic models, mathematical models which are designed for specific scenarios. For example, inside a city, people have created models to calculate how far we can transmit. Television stations have done a lot of measurements and they calculate mathematical models to know how far their TV broadcast can transmit. Therefore, they can know where to place the, the transmitting tower such that many people will receive that channel and indoor communications as well. So there are different models. We're going through just one of them, the free space path loss. So to illustrate how it works, we'll solve this problem. What do we know? So, we have, in this problem, we have our transmitting station and we have a parabolic transmit antenna, some dish-shaped antenna. It's got a diameter of one metre. It's going to transmit a signal and received by the same type of antenna, same size, just to keep things simple, the transmit and receive antenna are the same size, same characteristics. They don't have to be, but they are in this case. We're transmitting a signal with a frequency of 5 gigahertz. At my transmitter, I'm using signal strength of 1 watt, transmit power. PT is one watt. I transmit with one watt power. The distance between transmitter and receiver is one kilometre. 
So I'm one kilometer away from the transmitter. I transmit our signal. What happens is that we transmit the signal into the antenna. The antenna increases the signal strength. It has some gain. Signal comes out of the antenna with some strength. It gets weaker over distance and it's received with some signal strength. The receiving an antenna introduces some gain and the result is the received power level. The question is, what is the required received power threshold of the receiver? So, a receiver has some threshold which is the minimum power at which it can receive such that it understands. Same as your ears have a threshold. If I talk very quietly, even though you receive my signal, it will be too low for your ears to be able to decipher what is being said. Same with the receiver electronics. It has some received threshold. What is it? What is the minimum value of PR such that it will receive it? Well, we can calculate that based on what we know about the conditions using our free space pass loss model. If we assume perfect environment, no obstacles, we'll use our previous equation. which relates transmit power, receive power, antenna gain, distance and wavelength. We want to find PR, so rearrange that equation. What do we get? PR equals PT times GT. The receive power is the transmit power times the gain of the two antennas times lambda squared, the wavelength divided by 4 pi d all squared. That's just a rearrangement of the equation up there. To get we want to solve for PR. What do we know? Okay, in our equation we want to find PR. We know PT is 1 watt. We know D, the distance, is 1,000 metres. Do we know anything else? Lambda. Lambda is the wavelength, which is the speed of light divided by the frequency, and we know the frequency. So 3 by 10 to the power of 8, the speed of light, C, divided by our frequency of 5 gigahertz, which is 5 by 10 to the power of 9. Which is 0 0.06 meters. So we know the wavelength. 3 divided by 5 is 0.6. 10 to the 8 divided by 10 to the 9 is 10 to the minus 1, so we get 0 0.06 metres. We know lambda now. What about GT and GR? We don't have the specification. They are equal, that is, our transmit antenna is the same size, same shape as receive antenna. Therefore, the gains are the same. GT, we'll know, is the same as GR. But what is their value? What's G? What's the gain? Exam, this is a common exam question. How are you going to solve it? Okay, you're going to use an equation. We go back. When we spoke about antennas, there's an equation that relates the size of the antenna with the gain. So, let's use that. 
We s in the question it says we have two parabolic antennas. The gain is of any antenna is 4 times pi times the effective area over lambda squared. We know lambda. Yeah. The antennas are transmitting wavelength of 0 0.06 meters. 0 0.06. The effective area, because there are these parabolic dish-shaped antennas, let's assume that this applies. The effective area is a half of the area of that dish and treat, just treat it as a circle. It's one meter in diameter. The area is pi times the radius squared. The radius is half a meter. Diameter is one meter. Pi times radius squared times a half is pi over eight. Half times a half times a half is 1 over 8 times pi. That's the effective area of our antenna. Put that into here. We get 4 times pi times pi over 8 divided by lambda squared. 0 0.06 squared. Four pi pi over eight divided by lambda squared, and where lambda is from over here, 0 0.06 meters, and we square that. You need a calculator to calculate that. And with a calculator, I found that to be 1369, approximately. So that is the gain of our transmit antenna. And because the transmit antenna and receive antenna are the same shape, same size, it's also the gain of the receive antenna. OK, everyone's following so far? The maths is easy, so what we've done is we, based on the antenna effective area, we find the gain. And we assume that the effective area is half of the physical size. And it's just a circular shape antenna. Different antennas have a different effective areas. So we need to know something or make an assumption. Yeah. Everyone can get here? Any questions? Okay. This? This is a nine. One, three, six, nine. Approximately. And this is a gain in, this is an absolute value, not in decibels, absolute value. And in fact, that's what we want in this equation. This equation does not take decibels as input. These are all absolute values. Watts, what are absolute, or no units, an absolute gain. Lambda is in metres, distance in metres. So we have our values now because this is, in fact, GT and GR. That's a GR. 1369. The gain of the transmit antenna. What does it mean, 1369? It means compared to our isotropic antenna, this dish antenna magnifies the signal by a factor of 1369 
measure the signal one meter from your isotropic antenna and one meter from this antenna and the received power is going to be 1,369 times stronger from our antenna. That's what it means. So it magnifies, ampl amplifies our signal. That's our gain. We transmit with some power. The transmit antenna amplifies that signal. The amount is indicated by the gain of that antenna. The signal propagates, it loses power. Then the receive antenna amplifies the signal, measured by the gain of the receive antenna. The result is the receive power. And we can plug those values in and we'll get some number. PT is 1, GT is 1369, 1369, lambda is 0 0.06, D is 1000. And from memory, we get 40 something microwatts. It's about 43 microwatts. Again, you need your calculator there. 43 by 10 to the minus 6 watts. The units used. Yes, distance, meters. Wavelengths, meters. Yeah. Micro, micro watts, 10 to the minus 6. 10 to the minus 6. Sorry, well done. <coughs> that is, we transmit with 1 watt. The signal gets weaker over distance, over 1 kilometre. We receive with 43 micro watts. 10 to the minus 6. There's <coughs> 42 <coughs> divide by 1 million. Distance is 1,000. D, D is 1,000 metres, not one kilometre. We need to use the same units, metres, lambda in metres. And then you get, I think, 42.8 microwatts, 43 microwatts. Any questions before we move on? So, all right, if you understand that, what is the, what is the loss of our system? What's the loss of our communication system? Well, we transmit with one watt and we receive with 43 microwatts. We transmit with 1 watt, receive with 43 microwatts. That's 1 divided by 43 microwatts is around 250,000. The receive signal is 250,000 times weaker than the transmit signal. Not exactly about. One divided by 40 micro. Ah, uh, no. 25,000. 25,000 times weaker. So our loss in decibels is simply 10 log that value. Microwatt. That's hard to see. 10 times logarithm in base 10 of 1 watt divided by 43 microwatts. 
or about 25,000. which is something like 40-something decibels. So the loss of this system is around 40, 45 decibels. So that's, this is how we apply our free space path loss model. Also our antenna gain, but importantly, This is how we apply this equation. If we know some characteristics where we want to transmit, in this case we calculate if our receiver can receive a signal of 43 microwatts and understand 43 microwatts, we can communicate across this distance. But if we buy a receiver and the minimum signal strength it, it can understand is 50 microwatts, it will not be able to understand what is transmitted. That's normally a characteristic of the receiver. What is the minimum power that it can understand? In this case, it has to be above 43 microwatts. If not, they will not be able to communicate across one kilometre. And similarly, you can answer questions if we rearrange this. What is the maximum distance we could transmit if we know the transmit power and the receive power? Find D and so on. Take the log of 25,000 times by 10. Did anyone get an answer? Log of 25,000 is 4 point... Okay. 43. It's about 43 dB. 43 decibels is the loss. Note in this equation we can separate out those components. Think about our transmission system. We start with a transmit power, PT. Our gain or our antenna at the transmitter increases that by some gain. This is the amount of power we lose. Start with a transmit power, increase by the gain at the transmitter, increase by the gain at the receiver, and this represents the amount of power which is lost over the distance. And of course, the amount of power strength we lose depends on the frequency and the distance. Five more minutes. Any questions on this? So this is a threshold. Yes. So in our case, what we calculated was if if our receiver has a threshold above or can receive a yeah has a threshold below 43 microwatts, it will work. If it's above 43 microwatts, it will not work. If if my threshold of I buy a receiver and the threshold is 50 microwatts, it will not receive because the, a threshold means that the signal must be above that to be successful. That is, it's the cutoff. I'll show you an example of a... Yeah, it's a lower limit. Let's look at an example. This is a, another device, the wireless LAN access point, a special type from Cisco, and it has some specifications. Let's look at the specs. Scroll down a fair bit. This is for links between buildings. Look at, 
look at the first column here. This device transmits in this frequency range around 5.7 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz. This is the specification, the technology it uses. Note here, this indicates, it's called the receive sensitivity. The minimum power level such that it can successfully receive. If we're sending at a data rate of 6 megabits per second, the receive threshold, the lowest power it can successfully receive is minus 83 dBm. Now you can convert minus 83 dBm back to milliwatts. It is 10 to the minus 8.3 milliwatts. It's just a conversion between decibels and absolute value. Minus 83 dBm is 10 to the minus 8.3 milliwatts. If this device receives a signal greater than this receive power, it will understand. If it's less, it will not understand. That's the, the way that we interpret that. At different speeds, you have different receive thresholds. That is, if you want to send faster, you need to be closer. The design of the system... Yeah, receive sensitivity. How sensitive is the receiver? How low of a signal can it receive and understand? And it also includes in the specification transmit power. The maximum transmit power of this device is 250 milliwatts or 24 dBm. So this device, if you buy two of them, then you know the transmit power, you know the minimum receive power, frequency, you can find the distance. And that's one of your homework questions. It'll be on the website. Find the distance that you can transmit between these two devices. Any questions to finish up? Last two minutes. So I will post the homework and it's a question about using this device. Basically use the free space path loss model to calculate the distance between two devices, the maximum distance. I think that if you, trans if you put it too close, it may not be able to understand it. What's zero dBm? One, isn't it? It's the same. 10 to the power of zero? It's a one. So one milliwatt. Yeah. Yeah. One, one milliwatt, in fact.